Welcome to you all. It's good to be with you here digitally in this space, especially since those of you who have air conditioning, you can relax in the comfort of the air conditioning instead of in the humid heat of the sanctuary space. You are, of course, all with us, taped to the pews, as you have been since the beginning of this pandemic. Um, and uh, I wanted you to read this cartoon. Does that not sound familiar? We get so used to certain habits. But here's a habit we would love to invite you to. It goes like this. Love you. Uh, there's, there's far less confusion when multiple voices are singing during our live stream worship. So if you wish to volunteer to be part of our singing, you don't even have to be a choir member. If you wish to volunteer, just contact David Hamilton by calling the church office. And speaking of those who are helping, with our live stream singing this morning. I'd like to thank very much Elaine Holmes and, uh, oh God, here we go, <laughs> Diane Hickenhoff, sorry about that brain freeze, for, for augmenting the singing this morning. It is so wonderful to have you here with us. I also wanna thank very much Lynn Broughton, who is here at the keyboard. Uh, we're having a little bit of trouble periodically with the organ. You can never tell when it's gonna come on full bore. And while that's okay when you're at home, it's a little hard on the organist. So thank you, Lynn, for being here to lead us from the bench uh, this morning. It is deeply appreciated. We also have Sarah McKenzie, who presents our, our puts together our slide presentation every Sunday, for every Sunday. Uh, Jim and Judy Zerubic, who are on the uh, ministry team. Stu Metzger, who takes care of the building for us. However, um, it is, uh, we, while Stu is away on holiday this past week and the next, this week it was Ralph Knowles who's been taking care of his chores, and next week it'll be Jack Nanskeville who's doing all of that. And then the two Johns, John Phillips and John Brash, take care of our finances. So it's wonderful to have them. Because we use the screens exclusively, or at least the screen that you're watching, whenever you see red print in bold, it's for the worship leader, that's me to read. Whenever you see black print in bold, it's for everyone to read together, led by Judy Zerubic. Let's practice that as we acknowledge the territory on which we are privileged to gather. For thousands of years, First Nations peoples have walked this land, weaving their identity and their spirituality intimately with the land. European colonization came about in large part because of the doctrine of discovery a flawed understanding that ignores indigenous presence on the land. Affirming the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and therefore repudiating the wrong of such a doctrine, we begin our worship this morning by acknowledging the traditional territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe. We are all treaty people, parties to Crown Treaty 45 and a half in 1836. Keep us mindful of the covenants that have been made and broken with First Nations peoples. May we grow into living with respect on this land, walking into reconciliation through peace and friendship, while honoring all who live, work, and worship on it. There are a few announcements that I would like to share with you. First of all, uh, this actually appeared on uh, Joan Norris's Facebook page. Please hold Joan and Randy Norris in your prayers after their beloved Sassy passed over the Rainbow Bridge this past Wednesday. As Joan's Facebook post said, so many people shared treats with her in the past year. It was probably a bit of a waddle. <laughs> we will miss her terribly. I had the privilege of on Wednesday morning, being, or Wednesday afternoon, being able to scratch her and I had no idea that was going to be the last time I saw her. Also, Mission Sunday is coming on Sunday, September the 19th. Our guest uh, speaker is going to be Marissa Lair, who is the Public Education and Volunteer Coordinator for Women's House. And she's going to focus on three things. Well, number one, the impact of COVID-19 on the work they do. Number two, community education delivery during this time of pandemic and anti-racism and anti-oppression work that they have been doing. Now, a special offering will be collected virtually to support the work of Women's House. However you donate, and there are all kinds of ways online, just mark it for 
women's house and we'll make sure to pass that money directly along to them. There's also a, uh, a sad piece of news. Glenn Sutton fainted and had a serious fall causing hospitalization, affecting his speech, his understanding and his memory. He's now home and receiving occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, the whole thing. His progress is encouraging, we are told, but it will be a long path. The Suttons do welcome your prayers. If you wish to send a card, please email Marion Brown. Marion's email will be on the church website in the announcements soon, probably on Tuesday. As well, this is the meal that Morgan Ritchie was served as her final meal at home before she went off to university, Wilfrid Laurier. And I, and I will say uh, that's delayed by a year because actually her first year was last year. However, uh, we wanna wish the, all of those trekking off to residence and to school for the first time after secondary school in this pandemic. And we want them to be the very best and to be well. There's also a continuing summer spiritual exploration series. It's just an hour long. It starts with a video and then we have a discussion on the topic. This week's topic is, can we separate loving God and loving others? I find that Rob Bell's series doesn't ask the easy questions, but the ones that get us to really go more deeply into our faith journey. So join us. The link is on our website. And Joan Leaning, who died earlier this summer, is her funeral is taking place at the Davy Linklater Funeral Home this Wednesday at 2 o'clock. Since there is limited space, you need to call the funeral home to register to attend. So please, those of you who wish to do so, make that phone call and then you'll get on the list. Finally, there's a service of prayers with the music of Taze, not this Sunday, but next Sunday at 7 o'clock. It is a deeply contemplative worship service that grounds us in God's presence through sung chants and a variety of musical accompaniment interwoven with reverent silence. I would invite you to join us as we live stream on next Sunday night at 7. And as the church has done for millennia, I greet you. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. And you, I'm inviting you to share that peace with one another in whatever space you are, or share the peace with those who are not with you, but with you in spirit. Peace. As we recognize God's eternal and everlasting presence amongst us, let us prepare ourselves for worship. Let's join, let's join together and watch me light the candle. <laughs> May the light of Christ be our guide and our presence amongst and within God 
each step of every day. Let's join together in the call to worship and prayer of approach that you'll find on your screens. Events continue to unfold in the world while uncertainty abounds. Come then, though weary from what seems like constant change, to find sanctuary for our souls. We come to immerse ourselves in God's embrace of love. Come into this sacred space of welcome and of wonder, preparing to listen in hope. We come to rediscover our purpose, empowered by the Spirit. Come as those wounded by life's surprises, worn down by this prevailing pandemic, aching for relationships which restore our community of faith. We come to discover wholeness in new life offered by the risen Christ. As we recognize God's center in our living, let us pray. Your covenant with us, O Christ, is that you are with us to the end of the age. Renew our trust in your leading and in your teaching. Encourage us to incorporate your way into our living in challenging times. Restore our daring to explore emerging avenues to live our faith. Open our minds and our hearts to love in your name. Amen. Let us join together and sing Spirit Divine, attend our prayers. the word without really thinking about what we mean. We claim we say grace before our meals, but we are really asking God to bless the bounty we are about to consume. Grace. Grace is a gift to us all from the bounty of God's love for each of us and all of us. Grace is the encircling arms of God's forgiveness and embrace which is ever ready to heal us of all that harms us. Grace is a love lived fully in the difficult, painful, divisive realities of life. Grace is God's unconditional gift to the world. When we open ourselves to that gift of grace, we become whole. Thanks be to God. 
Let us then open our hearts fully and completely to God's healing grace as we enter into the intimate, silent prayer with God. Amen. So one of the themes this morning is the idea of covenant. And uh, I had the pleasure last Sunday afternoon of trekking up to the Cape Croker First Nation. And there I was able to, uh, to meet with Joyce Johnston, who happens to be the United Church student minister up there. Um, and she is a friend of mine, as are many of them up there. And uh, there was a purpose I went up there. Here it was. First of all, it was to recognize that these three people were the ones I went to see primarily, but there were actually four altogether. Joyce Johnson, who is on the left of your screen, volunteered as a member of the worship team for the Western Ontario Waterways Regional Council meeting in May of this year, so a few months ago. Ken Albert, who's in the middle, agreed and felt honored to act as a sacred firekeeper for the meeting. For the entire three-day meeting, he kept a fire outside in the palisade at the back of the United Church. Sheila Robins Robson, who is on the right, agreed to drum and to sing the water song as water walkers from Indigenous communities in Ontario were praying along the shores of Lake Huron. And I don't mean they just stand there and pray. They're praying as they walk the entire circumference of all the Great Lakes waterways, asking for purity of water, for wholeness of the ecosystem, and for the blessing of the Creator. Mike Johnson is Joyce's nephew and a lawyer who focuses on Indigenous justice issues, agreed to film his cousin Ken's teaching on the meaning of the sacred fire within Ojibwe spiritual teachings. And he did a wonderful job. Now this is the picture of all three of them together. You'll notice that they are wrapped in blankets that were created and woven by Indigenous peoples of the Navajo Nation. There is that is a thank you to all three of them from the Western Ontario Waterways region that I was privileged to extend to them. But I was told very clearly that in order to give them those blankets, I don't just hand them the package that came by Amazon. What I have to do is there is a ceremony necessary. First, the blankets need to be smudged with, with the sweet grass and prayers in the smudge infuse the fabric of the blankets. And then, and only then, are the blankets lifted onto their shoulders, wrapped around each of them, signifying the Creator's presence with them, among them, supporting them, strengthening them, and keeping them true to loving one another. It was a powerful experience for me because you know, I just figured I'd hand it over and we'd have a great conversation. They're good friends. They're people who have taught me much. And yet, it became a covenantal experience. Because you see, they were willing to enter into our spiritual practice. And this allowed me to enter into their spiritual practice. Because after all, our relationship has to be mutual. And if it isn't, then we just continue to do what we've always done to indigenous peoples. This is evidence of part of the path toward reconciliation. It's so easy for us at the beginning of worship to kind of nod your heads and go, okay, God keeps forcing us to acknowledge the land on which we gather. This is part of living those words out. May that be our covenant with one another in this land. Amen. 
Let's join together in saying the words that Jesus gave us in the paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer. Eternal Spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and what shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In the times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Our Bible reading this morning is from 1 Kings, chapter 8, verses 1 to 6. Sorry, verse 1, 6. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral houses of the Israelites, before King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Then the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the chair. Let us sing, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Continue with our reading from 1 Kings. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands to heaven. He said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart the covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him, you promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, there shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your children look to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Please remain seated and once again sing, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Regard your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today. 
that your eyes may be open night and day towards this house, the place of which you said, my name shall be there, that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays towards this place. Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. O oh, here in heaven, your dwelling place, heed and forgive. Again, remain seated and sing, Lord, prepare me a sanctuary. Final reading for today, continuing with First Kings. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand, and your outstretched arm. When a foreigner comes and prays towards this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all that the for foreigner calls to you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and so that they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built. together in prayer. Loving God, may your presence so fill us, no matter where we are, that we may know we are not alone, that we may know that in our living you walk with us always. May we be reminded of your covenant of love in Jesus the Christ, as we pay attention to you. Amen. Well, it's now been two weeks since I've been back from holiday, and I must admit, it was kind of like hitting the ground running and sprinting for the entire two weeks. I was full of busyness, trying to get things done. Apparently, there's a whole bunch of people who want to get married before the possibility of another lockdown, so they're striking while the iron is hot, and that's taking a lot of time for me to arrange. And it obscured that busyness all the time I need to reflect. Believe it or not, it's not a case that I just sit on my lazy boy and contemplate behind closed eyelids. <laughs> and on this Friday morning, I have a support group that we meet together usually once a month. Uh, we've been privileged to be able to meet together in person, although physically distanced. And it's a 90 minute drive to Elmira from here because that's where we met this Friday. And in that drive, both down and back, I rediscovered the opportunity to reflect and to think. And I rediscovered and, and, and was thrilled by finding in that reflection God's center within me. Now, Solomon was similarly looking to remind the people that he led as king about 
the centrality of worship within their lives. It was a, a constant reminder for them all of the covenant faith that they lived into each and every day. Even in the midst of their busyness, even in the midst of their distractions, even in the midst of the poverty some might feel, or the wealth and the privilege that others might feel. And it was kind of a, a, an enormous ribbon cutting at the temple in Jerusalem, and it signified the height of Solomon's career. After all, this temple was built as part of the promise that David was refused. David was not allowed to build a temple, but he was told by God that it would come to his son. And the glorious surroundings that were featured in the temple of the time were, were incredible. There was all kinds of modern art inside. It was modern construction, and there were all kinds of wonderful expensive things like the cedars of Lebanon, like gold statuary. Included, however, in the design, because the designers and the architects came from Philistine, you know, Goliath, remember that story? That is where they came from. We now call it Lebanon, but nevertheless, the Philistines were the ones who built, constructed, and designed the temple. And they kind of strayed from the original plans that you can actually find listed in the book of Leviticus, including a lot of non-Jewish, non-Hebrew, non-Israelite symbolism. Symbolism that they just kind of snuck in there that talked about their own faith story. And then as they all gathered, and I, we didn't read this part of it, it's a rather long passage in 1 Kings, but the priests started to come into the temple. And as the priests came in, a cloud enveloped them and everyone else who was there. And the cloud apparently, according to the scripture, silenced the priests. Sounds pretty good, eh? Silence Gordon, that would be wonderful. He talks on and on and on and on as you're all looking at your watches to see when I'm gonna get done. But, while the priests were silenced by the cloud that entered that space, it's the same kind of cloud that enveloped Moses when he went up on the top of Mount Horeb to get the Ten Commandments, the very Ten Commandments on tablets that were in the Ark of the Covenant that the priests brought into the Holy of Holies. And yet Solomon said this proudly, God, I want you to come in here to this place that I have built. And it would seem that Solomon was not very wise that day, despite his reputation, filling himself up with his importance and his status, ignoring those contractors and workers and, and the people who had funded the construction of the temple. What about all the little people who made it such a wonderful place? Were those elements that the Philistines snuck in, not the very opposite of the temple's purpose, to remind people of God's covenant with them? Why was Solomon pouring all of his words out when God was so obviously present in the cloud that enveloped the, the people inside the temple? We, too, have our own edifice complex when we talk about this building. We really do. We, we think of, you know, well, which church is yours? And we point to this building. You know, the one across from Victoria Park, right on the top of the hill in the center of town. The irony being that there's all kinds of churches in town that could say that they're in the center of town because they are, relatively. Are we ignoring the vibrant presence of God within and among us? Are we trying to capture God, to, to contain God, to control God within this building? Is it our words that are most important? Now, notice that I'm asking all of these questions while filling the space with, well, my words. What if we just paid attention to God's presence here and now. I know many of you, when you travel the countryside, have seen those signs that some farms have posted, signs that carry a quote from scripture. 
I'm not sure if the purpose of the sign is to try and convert you as you're driving past, or whether it's just to offer something a little bit more interesting as you drive past farm after farm after farm. But there was one place that I drove past, and it, I must admit, it caused me to stop, pull over, and take a good look. You see, the, there was a sign right behind a very beautiful garden. And the garden was full of plants. You could tell that they were planted in such a way that you could always see something blooming. You could always see color no matter what time of the year. Well, except in the winter time when the snow covered it. But it was diligently, beautifully cared for. And it spoke vibrantly of the glory of God's creation. And you know what the words of the sign behind the garden were? You shall reap what you sow. And in fact, it was the garden that spoke far more powerfully of the reaping of God's grace and beauty in the world than those words on plywood could ever have done. Maybe we need to take time, like that garden, and just soak in the light of Christ. Now, not to tear down Solomon too much, notice Solomon's prayer to God in this ribbon cutting ceremony. There is grace in that prayer, despite Solomon's, look at me, words. In his prayer, he said, he prayed to God that non-Israelites Foreigners, strangers, would be allowed to freely come into this place of worship to encounter God. That this temple, while intended to be a string on the finger of memory of the covenant that was made between God and the Israelites, would also be a covenant that would be experienced by all the people around, not just the so-called chosen people that all people were welcome into God's presence to worship, to contemplate, to listen, and to believe. The, mo the visible monument, this temple, to God's presence was something that you could sense as physical, representing the unseen divine presence of God. Solomon's hope was that such a structure would then be a way to keep them on the faithful path. He was rightly afraid that people would, once they got used to it all, kind of drift away to the practices that seemed to be most comfortable. There is danger in welcoming even the stranger into your space. Always a danger, just like there is for us today. You know, we have a sign out front that says, everyone welcome. Now, that made a whole lot more sense when the building wasn't closed. <laughs> but we do live in pandemic times, but the implication is still there, that everyone is welcome. doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, what you believe, what you say. And if we cannot contain God, bottle God, control God within this space, that means we have to understand that God is not just here for us. God is not saying that we are the only ones that understand and get it right. God invites all kinds of people into this space, people who are not like us. And you know what happens? We will be changed when we welcome others in. When we welcome them with open hearts and open minds, we will be changed. And I think that we struggle with that because we've always thought of ourselves as, you know, we're like the disciples. We're going out and we're sharing the good news and you should just soak it in and go, why, thank you so much, without argument and without debate. Remember last week I talked about Flora MacDonald, whom I heard speak at Epiphany Explorations about seven years ago in Victoria, BC. And uh, she was talking about her work uh, at that time that had been done in Afghanistan with uh, village women and girls 
as ways of trying to foster those networks of connection amongst the women and girls of Afghanistan that would provide a place of, of health and well-being and safety. And Flora confessed that she went into there figuring out that they had a plan, they would share it with these poor women and girls of Afghanistan, and then everything would be great. Because after all, they had worked hard on the plan. And then they got to Afghanistan. And they sat down with the girls. And they made the right mistake. They said, here's what we're thinking. What do you think? And that was the right mistake, was to ask the women and girls of Afghanistan what they thought. And what they said to Flora MacDonald and her teams, that won't work. That might work for you in Canada, or even North America, or perhaps Western Europe. It isn't going to work here. Let us tell you what we think might work. And if you're willing to fund what we think will work, we're in it for the long haul. And Flora MacDonald said to us who were listening, I didn't realize how arrogant I was being, but they showed me grace. They showed our team grace, and they listened to what we had to say and then gave us the straight goods. And once we were willing to listen, once we were willing to be changed, we were able to work together for the good of all of them and us. That is actually the covenant that is the string in our finger to remind us that we are interrelated, interconnected. We've heard it said from the very beginning of the pandemic, we're all in this together. Yeah, we are. But in that, we need to listen carefully to all diversity of opinions, perceptions, and ways forward. And we will be changed through God's blessing. May it be so. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. In the heat of the summer, a breeze, refreshing, restorative, relaxing. It feels like God's breath, a blessing, red, redolent with fragrant flowers, painted in rainbow colors, vibrant and, and alive, tasting of sweet strawberries and of tart rhubarb, whispering the fluid motion of gentle waves. For that breath, for that blessing, for that restoration, we give silent thanks. During our thanksgiving, we notice, however, the breeze is strengthening. In the shelter of our homes, a gale, a storm, frightening, furious, forceful. It feels like a threat, a challenge to our faith. The chaos and tragedy of the scenes at the Kabul airport, not to mention the scenes of forced marriage and murder we cannot witness. The rising case counts in this fourth wave due to the Delta variant. The drought on the prairies devastating entire farms and the wildfires in British Columbia and Northern Ontario. The boil water advisory is still harming First Nation communities like Cape Croker, as well as the generational journey of listening and of reconciliation. The she session affecting so many marginalized women across this nation, and some who are not that marginalized. The return of children to school in two weeks' time, along with the return of post-secondary students to institutions fraught with uncertainty. As we worry and wonder, there are times we feel 
abandoned. There are times we feel helpless and without control. Each concern feels like another crashing wave in the storms of life. We yearn for your presence. We need to be saved. Help us, we pray. In our prayer, in our communion with you, O oh God, we find those storms calmed, those waves subside, those worries wash away. There is only our equipping in you because you give us what we need to reach out. The breeze whispers again, but it whispers of challenge and of opportunity, those things for which we are gathered and gifted in Christ's name even within the storms which always arise. It is indeed our blessing and our hope. Thank you for your direction, for your encouragement to make a difference. Amen. This Sunday's Minute for Mission travels overseas to the continent of Africa. This story shows that it's not easy being a trailblazer no matter where you live. Bareri was the first farmer in her small Ethiopian village to practice conservation agriculture, a method of reducing tilling and using intercropping and mulching to improve the success of crops. Ferreri remembers the way the other farmers in her village laughed at her when she began to farm differently. It's a waste of time, they said. It will never work. Fast forward three seasons. 
Bereria's crops are overflowing. She beams with pride as she talks glowingly about her thriving crops, inviting visitors to taste her fava beans. Bereria's method of farming is so successful that she is able to feed her growing family of six. In fact, she has so much produce that she sells the extra to buy school supplies for her children. Bereri learned these life-saving farming skills through a Canadian Food Grains Bank program called Scaling Up Conservation Agriculture in East Africa. The program is important because most of the African continent's soil is poor quality compared to the other parts of the world. In many areas, the soil is so eroded that it is no longer productive. Conservation agriculture is key to improving the soil, which in turn saves lives. The United Church works in partnership with agencies that coordinate life-changing agricultural pro projects across the globe. Your generosity helps farmers feed their families and communities. If mission and service is already a major part of your life, thank you so much. In your giving, you have not just given, you have helped to save and transform lives, inspire meaning and purpose, and build a better world through mission and service. Supporting agricultural programs is how you, how we help make a lasting difference. Thank you. There are so many other ways that you all give to the mission and ministry of this congregation whether it's online by pre-authorized pre remittance, or whether you just send a, an e-transfer to John Phillips, our donation steward. However you give, let us ask for God's blessing on that which we offer. We offer to you, O oh God, these gifts of abundance and of commitment. Bless them for your mission in the world to transform lives in Jesus' name. Bless us that we may ever consider your mission as our mission. Amen. Our closing hymn is Would You Bless Our Homes and Family?
ago, as a people gathered by the sender of love, upheld by the one who came in love, sent out in the power of love, go in peace. <laughs>